Hey guys, this is the first of what I anticipate will be many fixed episodes over the course of this series, because it's inevitable as we're building things episode to episode, we're going to run to issues, going to realize, ah, that's not quite what I was going for with the initial build. And first thing, case in point, so I jump up in the air, cast a channeled spell, and all of a sudden he's floating in midair. Hey guys, so welcome to patch point zero 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 one. First ever patch of our not a game yet game. Inevitably, we're going to have these fixed episodes from time to time, but I'm always going to try to release what I consider a real episode simultaneously or shortly thereafter after the fixed episode. And I debated when to do this fixed episode in the series, but I wanted to do it now because we're about to go into some brand new stuff. We're about to begin tackling our air abilities. That's going to be a lot of fun. And so just want to knock out all the fire ability fixes before we get into that. So these are the issues we're tackling this episode. And the first two, they're more of like fixes, things that we should definitely fix if we can. And the final three, they're more aesthetic in nature, are things that I think, ah, I can make this a little bit better. So let's get to it. So we're going to start today by fixing the lovely floating in the air issue that you saw in the intro. So for that, we've got to go back to our content drawer and we're going to go into core folder and then into our third person character blueprint. And the way we're going to fix that is we're going to update a function that we created about three episodes ago once we started activating our abilities off of our hotbar. And that's under our gameplay abilities here. And we have a function for ability can be activated or deactivated. Because basically we need to check, okay, if the player's in the air, should they be able to activate that ability? Now, the way I'm going to set this up is for any channeled abilities, the answer is going to be no. But for any like one-time cast abilities, like our fireball, that's going to be yes. So I'm going to go into our ability can be activated or deactivated. And we're already doing some checks here whether or not the ability is valid. But the check we need to add here is evaluating our enum, how our gameplay ability is being used. And I think we updated that on our gameplay abilities back in episode 33. And so from our gameplay ability hotbar get here, I can get the enum, how gameplay ability is used. And then from that, we can check, okay, is that equal to equal enum? And is it equal to channel? And in the future, if there's any other types here that if the player is falling or in the air, we don't want them to be able to cast, then we're going to need to extend this logic. But for now, this will suffice. And then we need to get a reference to our anim BP, so our anim BP reference. And that's what's going to tell us, is our player currently falling? And then I can drag out a reference to that, get is falling. And if both of these things are true, so if this is true and if is falling is true, then we don't want this to be able to be activated or deactivated, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to switch it over to a not. Not this one, come up, not Boolean here. So then I'm going to connect this one that's already assessing, okay, is our gameplay ability valid and can it be activated or deactivated? So that needs to be assessed and this whole thing needs to be assessed as well. And then from the and here, I can connect it up here. And then I'm going to move this out a little bit just to make it a little bit cleaner. Same with all this. I'm going to move this down and we're going to comment this because we might forget otherwise. So the comment is going to be cannot be activated if it's a channeled ability and character is falling. Compile and save. And let's do one other thing in our event graph for our third person character that I never cleaned up two episodes ago. So if we go back to our event graph, we set up all these keyboard buttons, but I never deleted out all of this logic. So let's delete that out now and we can move up some of this. So this is our logic for activating our inventory. And then this one is our pickup ability logic. All right, so I pick up my flamethrower. I'll pick up some other abilities too. And we also want to test this out for other abilities. Like I should be able to cast a fireball while jumping. Yeah, so that works fine. So now let me try the flamethrower. And what I'll do is I'll spam it repeatedly on the way down. So we'll flamethrower it. And then finally, when I land, then I can do it. But you'll notice that it takes like an extra 0.2 seconds for me to actually go into it. So we should be able to make that flamethrower activate faster when I land. And I have a way of doing that. And so to make that activation occur more quickly when I actually land, we're going to go into our animation blueprint. So mine is under core ABP third person character. So back in episode 27 with our flamethrower episode, that's where we actually created our state machine for spell casting standing still. And the issue is if I go under our anim graph and then into main states, the issue is that spell casting standing still can only be activated from locomotion. And what I'd like to do is I'd like it also to be activated directly from landing. And this is a really easy fix. I just move this up. I'm going to connect it to land. And then just like from locomotion here where the Boolean variable spell casting standing still has to be true, we're going to do the same thing over here. And this is a variable that we set up in episode 27, which is our flamethrower episode. So spell casting standing still, drag this in, get, and then connect this up. Compile and save. All right, so spamming flamethrower. It's a pretty quick transition. 
there's a couple other things that I want to fix relative to our flamethrower. And I think this is more of a game mechanics thing. But I anticipate because the player is having to stand still while using these channeled abilities, they're going to be kind of vulnerable. And because of that vulnerability from a gameplay mechanics standpoint, I anticipate that either channeled spells with a player standing still, they're going to need to be really powerful, or they need to be able to be cast more quickly. And if I hit one right now, like it takes like two seconds before that flamethrower even starts. And then by that time, the enemy could be off and running. And then the other thing is coming out of the ability, I can't run right away. It takes like an extra 0.2 seconds, 0.3 seconds to actually start running. And so I'd like to adjust both those things. I'd like to make it so that the flamethrower can be cast very quickly and also that the player can come out of it a little bit faster. So we're gonna go back to our animation graph. And the first thing we're gonna do is in our spell casting standing still state machine, the channeled spell begin here. I'm just gonna set our begin animation here to play much faster. So I'm gonna play it at 1.4 times speed, compile and save, and we'll see the difference that makes. And then to come out of the animation much faster, if we go back to our main states. So coming out of our spell casting standing still state machine, it's this transition right here. And if you remember back in episode 27, we actually set that to be a long duration, like 0.4 seconds. I'm just gonna decrease that to the normal duration of 0.2 seconds. Compile and save. And that's gonna allow our player to start moving very quickly as soon as they end the spell. All right, let's take a look at our casting time now. So one, much faster, and then ending it, yeah, I'm back to normal, a little bit faster. So the next issue I want to solve is related to inverse kinematics of the player's feet. So you see right here, inverse kinematics is doing just fine when he's in idle state or walking or running. But when I start casting channeled spells, so then our feet are completely floating off the ground. So back in our animation blueprint, we have to go into our anim graph here. And what we ended up doing in episode 27 is we disabled foot IK on our control rig whenever spellcasting standing still was true. And I did some playing with this, and we can still keep the control rig foot IK up and running while using the spellcasting standing still. We just need to adjust the feet a little bit, and it's going to work just fine. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to get rid of this and statement, and then we're going to go into our control rig here. Now in our very next episode, we're going to create a brand new control rig from scratch. It's basically going to be a control rig beginner tutorial, but I am far from a control rig expert. But I've done enough playing around in here that I generally have a sense of how this is working. And so the first thing it's doing is it's assessing, okay, should we do IK trace or not? And if false, it does absolutely nothing. So the entire node in our anim graph here does nothing. But if it's true, then it does this sequence of A through D. And the first thing it does right now, I think we set this up back in episode 25, is it's assessing, okay, if should do IK trace is true, then it does the whole thing. And if not, it sets an offset target of negative seven. And episode 25 was our Mixamo retargeting episode, like how to get Mixamo animations into Unreal Engine and targeted to the Unreal Engine 5 mannequin. And we set this to be negative seven just to work with those animations from Mixamo. But what's happening here is if should do IK trace is true, then it's doing foot traces for both the left foot and the right foot based on the IK foot bones. And then based on those foot traces, then it's setting an offset value for the feet, basically determining how far up or down the feet should be. And then based on this offset value, it's calculating exactly what the hips should do, the knees, all that stuff stuff down here. All of this stuff, it's complicated. We're not going to mess with that. But up here, after this chain of events, so if spellcasting standing still is true, then all we need to do is we need to adjust these targets just a little bit. And I think the effect is going to work just fine. So first, within our control rig, we need a new variable. So we're going to hit plus sign here, and the variable is going to be spellcasting standing still. And that's going to be a Boolean variable. But we do need to make this instance editable and exposed on spawn, and you'll see why. And then after all of this, we get to come over here and let's drag out a pin. And then from here, we'll do a branch. And the branch is going to assess that variable, spellcasting standing still. And then we can connect it up here. And if this is true, then we're going to set our Z offset L target and our Z offset R target. So I'll drag out another pin here, set Z offset R target. Because basically what we're doing is if this is true, we're going to override what this is doing right here but we're not overriding it completely. We're basically just going to adjust slightly what it's already doing with the line traces. So the way we're going to adjust them is I'm gonna start with the L, so get Z offset L target. And then from that, what I found to work best is if we just subtract five. And basically what this is doing is telling the foot to be five units lower than it otherwise would be. And then I'll connect this up here and we'll do the same thing for the right. So get Z offset R target. We're gonna subtract five, subtract five, not 50 and then connect it up here. So it's still doing the line trace, it's still doing all this work, but it's just saying, okay, if we're spellcasting standing still, make those feet go five units, five centimeters further down. 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to drag this out and I'm going to add a comment to that effect. So comment if character is spellcasting standing still, subtract 5 from the Z offset calculated. So compile and save. And then the last thing we need to do is back in our animation blueprint, we now have the spellcasting use pin node. And this is actually, it's actually cutting off the name, but this right here is coming from this right here, spellcasting standing still. And it's because I exposed it here that it's then showing up as an option for our input. I just need to check it here to actually have a pin. And then what I'm going to do, I can get rid of the knot here as well. I can just connect up spellcasting standing still to here. And then this one to should do IK trace compile and save and we are ready to test this. All right, so my feet are a little bit staggered. They're already doing the IK trace and now let's try it. So there we go. So look at our feet. They're still doing the staggering and it's not perfect, but it's definitely B plus. It's definitely a lot better than it was. So that's how we're going to handle any spell that's cast while the player is standing still. And I'm going to need to check this on an individual Mixamo animation by animation, but I think it's going to work. And worst case scenario, I might need to re-import a Mixamo animation and then adjust the Z value of that animation in order to get the right effect. So we just have two other fixes that I want to do this episode. One is related to the flamethrower, so let's do that first. And this is more of an aesthetic thing than anything else. So it's in our content folder. We're going to go into our Niagara stuff, and it's in our gameplay abilities, fire, and it's for the flamethrower. And we got to go into our flamethrower with UP Niagara system here. What I want to adjust here is the fade out of the fire, because I noticed that as the particles are deteriorating, the alpha, it's just very intense still all the way to the end. It's very abrupt that that fire gets cut off. And this is driven in the color node here. The other thing to note about this is that alpha, that's what's actually driving how intense our burn decals are being applied. And it's also going to drive how much damage is applied whenever that particle hits. So if the flamethrower hits and it's all the way at the end, then it's gonna do much less damage than if the flamethrower particle hits here in its lifespan. But what I want to adjust is that this should be lower than just 0.5. So right here, if I zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, and this is going to go I'm going to put it down at 0.25. I'm just going to drag it down, drag it down. Yeah, 0. Point, right about there. And then the same thing for the other color node here. So right there, zoom in, zoom in, zoom in, all the way down to 0. 0.25. So it's going to drop just to have a much greater translucency to it at the end of its lifespan. Yeah, so just looking at the fire particles all the way at the end there, they're just a lot more translucent. So the very last optimization we're going to do is related to the fireball explosion sound, because as it currently stands, the sound is always the same. So watch this. I guess I should say listen to this instead of watch, but yeah, the sound's identical every single time. So I want to do two things to randomize the sound a little bit. I want to randomize the pitch of the sound within a range, but I also want to set a random start time. And so for that, we have to go back to our content drawer. I'm going to go back to content under blueprints and under our spawn from abilities. We have to go into our BP fireball. In this, we started in episode 30. And on the event graph here, if I zoom out, we created this explode fireball function. I'm going to go into that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in to where we play the explosion sound. I'm going to make some more space after that. The first thing I'm going to do is from this play, we're going to get a random float in range. So random float in range and then connect this up. And the randomness is going to start anywhere from 0 to 0 0.2 seconds into the start of that explosion sound. And the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to get another reference to our explosion sound. And for this, I'm going to set our pitch multiplier. And that's also going to be randomized a little bit. So we'll connect this up here, connect this up here, and then copy our random float and range. And for this, the pitch modifier is going to be between 1 and 1.3. And connect that up, just a higher pitch. Compile and save. All right, so let's listen to the variation of our fireball sound. Sounds a little bit more intense, right? Like you can imagine those things blowing up around you. I think it's gonna be fun. So that just about wraps up our first issue fix episode. But for our next episode, we're going to dive into control rig just a little bit more deeply. I know we've been playing with control rig a little bit in a couple of different episodes, but I haven't actually covered it in an episode. And so that's what we're going to do. But even still, control rig is this vast, very complex thing, and I understand about this much of it. So we're doing just the basics. But the one use case I've been thinking about is, although our character's body is turning when we're holding right click, our character's head and neck isn't turning when holding right click. And realistically, you'd want the character to actually be able to look at whatever they're aiming towards. So now if I hold right click, 
Yeah, so you see his head and neck is actually turning. He can look up now, he can look to the side. So his body turns a little bit, but his head and neck turns almost 180 degrees to the left and to the right. And we're going to accomplish that with a brand new control rig next episode. So I hope to see you there.